I love stories. And no one knows how to spin a good yarn like Irish-American playwright John Patrick Shanley. His characters may be swindlers or fools, dangerous or in distress, cocky or confused, but they're rarely victims. They know how to tell a story and they always, always have a point of view. When Stanley wrote Rogue's Gallery at the height of the COVID pandemic last year, he wanted to provide material crafted specifically for actors to perform in this medium and designed to help raise money for struggling theaters across the country. Lots of my professional actor friends have strong connections right here in the Capital District. And I knew for a fact that they were hungry for a chance to perform. And boy, were they up for the challenge. I am so grateful to Actors' Equity who allowed Theatre Voices to use a union contract to help raise money for Steamer 10, which is home to Theatre Voices live shows and a place that brings live performance to young people as part of their mission statement. Just FYI, most of the stories that you're about to hear are between four and six minutes long, and it runs about an hour and 10 minutes, and there's no intermission. So hope you've got a comfortable chair and a tasty beverage and that you enjoy the show. Welcome to Rogue's Gallery, uh, but first. Hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the first ever online Theatre Voices production, Rogue's Gallery by John Patrick Shanley. I'm Theatre Voices board member, Dr. Krista Dennis. As you know, the past year plus has been a very difficult time for theaters, many of which have had to close their doors, in some cases permanently. When Yvonne Perry approached us with the idea to direct this piece, specifically written to help theaters during the pandemic, we jumped at the chance. The entire company of actors agreed and are all donating their time. This production is a fundraiser for our home base, Steamer No. 10 Theater in Albany. Steamer 10 still has to keep the building running, even when they're not producing shows. Your tax-deductible contribution will help them stay afloat until we can perform there again in person. You can send your contribution through the link in the comments section below. If you're joining us during our premiere, feel free to say hello in the chat window. The production will remain available here on YouTube through Monday, April 12th. And now, without further ado, Rogue's Gallery. I am a man. And that is a terrible thing. My great-grandfather was a gaucho in Argentina and hunted with the bolas. The bolas is a simple weapon, two steel balls connected by a length of sturdy cord. My father taught me how to fling them in the woods behind our house. And though we'd become Americans, this was his way of keeping the gaucho spirit alive in me. It worked, I guess. I am proud, perhaps too proud. Well, my wife was unfaithful to me. Unfaithful with a man a little more successful than me, a little younger than me. I forgave her weakness, but became silent. I had decided the man was to blame. It was the manager down at the factory where we all worked. His name was Victor. He had high spirits and laughed a lot. But I didn't like his laugh. It was the laughter of an ignorant man. A man who believed all people are basically the same, which is foolishness. Thought he knew a lot about women in particular, but he knew nothing really, except that they liked him. He did not understand, for instance, that a married woman who's been unfaithful will often confess what she has done to her husband as mine did. And he clearly did not understand the depth of feeling a man, a man such as myself may have for his wife. And finally, his worst sin, he did not realize the kind of man I was and that he was in danger. I did nothing to let him know. He had come upon me secretly, presenting me with an innocent face and I would do the same. I befriended him. And at the local bar, I would buy two beers and give him one. I could see the extra merriment in his eyes as he savored my innocent friendship. My wife was terrified. 
She knew I was a loaded gun, though I said nothing. Her fear was that I would pull the house down on myself. She came over to the bar once, but when she saw how easy I was with him, how unsuspecting he was, she couldn't take it and went home. She offered herself to me that night. I refused. I told her I would not sleep with her till he was dead. I followed him. Found out where he lived, where he parked, what other women he was messing with. One of the women lived over a store and he would climb a long flight of outdoor stairs to see her. One night I saw this woman greet him with a kiss. I saw how it must have been with my wife. That picture in my mind made my hands shake. When I got home, I could not sleep in our bed. In the morning, my wife woke me on the couch. Her eyes were like dull steel. She looked at me and said, if you're gonna do it, do it. The next night, he went to see the woman who lived over the store. He climbed the long stairs two at a time. He was in there an hour. I waited. When he came out, when he was on the top of the stairs, I flung the bowlers like a lightning bolt. They wrapped around his ankles and down the stairs he fell. It was a bad fall. I went and took the bowlers from off his legs. He was alive, but ruined. I looked at him into his eyes and said, my wife. And then I left. They say he can't walk, but I don't know. He's gone. Moved back to his family's town in California. We have a new floor manager. When I got home that night, got in bed with my wife, and we made love, she didn't ask me if I killed him. But later, when she heard he was alive, she looked at me with a question in her eyes. I had no answer. Over time, a silence like respect grew up like a hedge around the whole thing. It was over. I can't talk long. I'd FaceTime you, but Ralph comes home unexpectedly. On purpose. <laughs> He knows I'm thinking of someone else. In fact, he knows it's you. <laughs> we don't talk about it. We did when he found that text, but it always turned into a fight and we can't afford to fight, right? <laughs> Not with the lockdown. He keeps proposing. <laughs> it's ludicrous, I hate him. But I can't leave the puppy. It was a genius move on his part, getting the puppy. How are you getting along with your wife? Terrific, I bet. Men are so good at turning off parts of their brains. I had a dream last night where I cooked and ate these exotic little fish, white, orange, maybe yellow. Someone asked me how they tasted they tasted weird. I wasn't completely sure I didn't like the taste, but I was pretty sure I didn't like it. I almost want to say bitter, but that wasn't quite right either. I think I'm losing my mind. <clears throat> Last night I was sleeping downstairs with the puppy, but I couldn't sleep. 
I wanted my vibrator because that helps me, but I had left it upstairs. I wanted to get it, but I was afraid I'd wake Ralph and that he'd want sex, so I didn't get it. <laughs> I didn't sleep at all. <laughs> it's proof I love you that I let you see me like this. <laughs> Or maybe it's proof I don't give a fuck. I'm worried about other people worrying about money. I'm broke, but I'm used to it. But I think of these other people who had real lives and now everything's fallen apart. They're not used to chaos. My mother isn't used to everything being pointless. Do you even remember me? Sorry. Don't let me put this on you. <sighs> I've got to get out of here. <clears throat> what about the puppy? Ralph paid for it, but it's so my puppy. Where did the future go? I always thought about the future and now there's nothing there. You're not leaving your wife, not now, admit it. And I was a disaster before the epidemic. The good news is now everyone's a disaster so I can blend in. <laughs> but I'm so scared, babe. <clears throat> And it's not the virus, it's me. It's me and God locked in a room. It's judgment day and there's no heaven, only justice. And justice scares me more than anything because what have I done with my life? I'm so trivial, I've wasted my life and now this is what I'm left with. This is my story and there's nothing in it. I never chose a thing. I just ran until the road ran out. You're gone. No, I'm gone. I ache. I ache in my stomach from emptiness. <laughs> I love you. Save me. <laughs> you can't. <clears throat> I never started and now I'm done. <sighs> I can hear his car pulling in. Listen. Save yourself. Remember me? I was almost a person. I'm looking out my window. The sky is right there. Why can't I have it? I bought this townhouse from a couple of old gay guys in the West Village and found an artificial lake in the basement. Now, there was other stuff down there the previous owners had left behind, but the lake stood out. Who leaves a lake? For a minute, for a joke, I was going to hang it over the fireplace on the parlor floor, but uh, my wife Kitty nixed that idea. She said I should just return it. So. I called the fellas I'd bought the place from. One was a doctor, one was a lawyer. I got the lawyer. He said it wasn't his leg and hung up. I stared at my phone. It wasn't his leg? I showed the leg to my friend Henry, who's an orthopedic surgeon. He said, it's a woman's leg. Well, that stumped me a little. Two gay guys had lived there for a long time, at least 20 years. Did some woman come to visit and leave without her leg? Henry said it was probably from a relative who died, something like that. Then 
Why didn't the gay lawyer say that? He probably left it on purpose, and if he admits it's his, he'll be saddled with it again. Now it's your problem. My advice, just throw it away. Now, I'm the kind of guy who can't throw leftovers away because there are people somewhere who are hungry. How could I throw a perfectly good leg away when there might be some one-legged woman somewhere who would be thrilled to get this thing, strap it on, and go ballroom dancing? <laughs> That's when Kitty laid down the law. She said, the leg is creepy. If nobody's claiming it, throw it away. So, I got the leg and put it out in the trash. But then I stared at it and started freaking out. I couldn't stick a woman's leg in my trash can. The garbage guy would flip out. I mean, it looked like a leg. I took it back in the house and back down to the basement. I figured I should bust it up and then put it in a garbage bag and throw the bag in the trash can. Easy peasy. So, I got a hammer and started hitting the leg. It was tough. I guess they make them withstand a lot of abuse. Finally, I went a little berserk and smashed the leg against the basement wall about 50 times. Nothing. So I swung it like a baseball bat against a big pipe and it started cracking. <laughs> that got me excited. Kitty came running downstairs yelling, what the hell are you doing? But I just kept whacking the pipe with the leg. And then, I mean, without any warning, the foot flew off and hit Kitty right in the head, knocked her out cold. She went down like a ton of bricks. I dropped what was left to the leg. And the next minute, Kitty was in my arms. She started to come too. There was a footprint on her face. We were both in shock, I guess. She started laughing and crying and I was babbling, trying to explain. We still have the foot. That's it on the mantle. <laughs>
went on until I was practically dying. Finally, she stopped inflicting pain and said she wanted to do a cupping. I said, okay, I've been cupped before. They take these little sucking gizmos, about eight of them, and they get them sucking on your back about 10 minutes. And then they pop them off and they read the circular hickeys thus created for information. The new wrinkle Ying introduced me to was that once she did my back, she had me turn over and did my front. The result was I was covered in polka dots. She told me to come back in two days. So when I went back, she started quizzing me about my old acupuncturist. Had he given me Chinese medicines? Yes. Had he started acting strangely? Yes. I told her how he'd said he'd become a shaman in his new age clothes. And she started digging her hands into my stomach. Oh, I closed my eyes. Oh, the pain was so intense I started seeing visions. I saw a kind of dinosaurs struggling in a tar pit and, and volcanoes and Norwegians. At first I didn't realize I was describing this stuff, saying what I was seeing, but Ying kept asking me what I was seeing and I guess I was narrating. My eyes popped open from a sudden, intense pain. I looked down, and Ying's hand was halfway inside my navel. She was literally rummaging in my abdomen. I tried to say something, but what came out didn't sound completely human. Oh. And then, while I watched, she pulled a filthy, wriggling black fish out of me. It stank, and it had teeth. She threw it to the floor, picked up a metal wastebasket, and beat the fish to death. Suddenly, I felt better and said so. She just nodded wearily and wiped the black spatter from her arms. She handed me a towel and said I should never go back to my old acupuncturist, that he was a bad man. That's when I decided maybe I wouldn't see an acupuncturist anymore. I'm scared to death. <laughs> but let me back up, uh, way up. <laughs> I met a guy named Dudley at this book party thing, and even though his name was Dudley, we hit it off. <laughs> See, he was a hybrid, a location scout writer, and had all these great stories. And at first, my interest was professional. I'm a journalist, and I thought I could get a column out of the conversation. I'm always looking for a column. And I definitely wasn't looking for romance because I was engaged. My South American sweetheart, Hernando Ruiz, was away that weekend in Colombia visiting his mother, Agata. Agata, and by extension, Hernando owned half of Colombia. And my fantasy, which was totally realizable, was to settle down with Hernando in some alternate paradise of servants and lush vegetation. But not this evening, because Hernando was away. And Dudley was funny as hell. My friend Kathy came over from her table. And she, I could tell she was on pink alert because she knew Hernando. And who was this guy? And why was I having such a good time? And she thought maybe I was tipsy, but I, I wasn't. I was <sighs> charmed. <laughs> Severely charmed. See, Dudley did this thing. He just, 
He beamed this joy at me. Joy evidently caused by me, my presence, the fact of me. And that was making me feel elevated, appreciated in some other way than I had ever been appreciated before. I remember thinking, who is this woman he's seeing? I want to be her. Uh, Kathy mentioned Hernando, but it just bounced off. I let her know that I was fine. She could return from whence she came. She shrugged and departed. I went back to basking in Dudley's energy. He was Canadian from Vancouver. He got in a green card and transplanted to New York. He wore these silver-rimmed glasses and his eyes were intensely blue. And after half an hour, I wanted to sleep with him. Immediately and repeatedly. No, I, I didn't, of course. I was practically under contract to Hernando, but when Dudley walked me to my car, he kissed me. And it was like a crystal chandelier fell on my head. <laughs> I, I actually became witless for a moment. I, I don't think I could tell you my mother's maiden name. And, and then he did this little thing. He, he put his hand on my arm I swear to God, it burned me. When I got on the plane for Bogota, I looked at my arm and I'll take an oath to Jesus. It was marked in red where Dudley touched me. And I, I stared at it until I fell asleep. And when we landed, Hernando picked me up at the airport. In the car, I started staring out the window and stroking my arm. Hernando pulled over and said, what have you done? I told him about the kiss and that I couldn't stay. And that's how my engagement ended. <laughs> it was precipitous. He said his mother, Agata, had warned him about me. She had told him women like me were a dime a dozen and that he'd been a fool not to know it. And the first thought I had was, <laughs> she could have been my mother-in-law. <laughs> I dodged a bullet. When I got back to New York the next day, I called Dudley, trying to sound casual. And the following morning, he took me upstate to scout a farmhouse for a film. And there was a bed. He found my neck, and in a blaze of light or something, buried himself in me like a bobsled in an avalanche. I literally don't remember any transition. It was like time travel. We were talking, I looked at the floor, we were naked in bed. And then we went rock climbing. I mean, that's not something I ever thought I'd do, but I was emboldened. A different kind of love had found me. And it was all like that. We were immediately miles down Relationship Road. We knew each other. It was intense, but at the same time, it was a canoe ride full of leisurely sighs and idyllic passages. We went rock climbing once a week. We had dinner all the time, road trips. He read my articles and said things that made me feel great and still inspired me to do better. And yeah, I, I won't talk about the lovemaking except to say the word sacred comes to mind. And our conversations were luxurious, funny. They made me feel not alone for the first time in my life. Then Kathy called. <laughs> Kathy needed to talk to me right away. We had lunch. She had heard from Hernando, knew I'd called it quits. And she knew, of course, that I was in deep with Dudley. So she got right to the point. This guy, Dudley, there's something you don't know about him. And there's something you don't know about you. <laughs> me? I mean, what could Kathy be talking about? She took out her phone and showed me a picture. It was a picture of me and Dudley in some restaurant, and I wondered who took it. Kathy leaned forward and whispered, It's not you. I felt strange in a way I'd never felt strange before. Kathy went on. That's Dudley with his ex-wife. 
Dudley had been married to a woman who was my identical twin in Canada. Her name was Renee. They'd divorced a few years before. He'd scrubbed his social media so there was no easy evidence of her. Of course, if one was looking for the information, it wasn't hard to find. I found it. <laughs> the woman looked so much like me, I called my mother. My mother looked at the picture and thought oh, I was joking. She, th she thought it was me. And when I convinced her that this wasn't some elaborate put on, she said I had to go to Vancouver for a face-to-face. -face. She even offered to go with me. I said no. I would go alone. Dudley called and I put him off. I said I had an assignment out of town and was leaving right away. He asked where and I said, Vancouver. His casual tone faltered a little, but he kept it cool and let the end of the call happen without admitting anything. When I hung up, I was insane. I, I was a, a replacement. I remember knocking over my mother's favorite lamp when I was a teenager and buying another so she wouldn't know. It, it was like that. I was a fucking lamp. Talk about being objectified. Kathy called. I told her what was going on and swore her to secrecy. And when I arrived, I called Renee from my hotel. It was raining. Apparently it's always raining in Vancouver. She answered. She was an actress. God, how humiliating. A fucking actress. I told her I was doing a story on the acting scene in Vancouver and could I take her to some place for a quiet drink? She was more than amenable. We agreed to meet up in a tea room. I got there early. There were two Asian women in the corner. The place was otherwise empty. I ordered a pot of tea and some cookies. They were served. And then Renee walked in. Her easy smile faded into quiet chaos when she saw me. She was going through the stages one goes through when one sees herself across a room. Yeah, I describe her reaction more, except my own observational skills are being overwhelmed by emotions. <laughs> and who has this experience? Not only was I seeing myself across a room walking towards me, I was also meeting my rival. She arrived at the table and forgot to sit, and I forgot to invite her to sit. After I don't know how many minutes like this, I said, Renee, and she sat down. Another silence. Then I said, Dudley. She said, Dudley, back to me. I nodded. I poured her tea and told her what I knew. And she looked mystified. And after a while, she said, but he left me. Why would he look for another me when he didn't want the me he was married to? I, I didn't expect that. You know, I figured he'd been obsessed with her, she dumped him, and that I was his consolation prize. I looked at Renee and thought, we're husks. We're two husks. I did, couldn't get further with the idea. I thought about Dudley. <laughs> then I thought about Hernando. The reason I thought about Hernando was he walked in. <laughs> he stopped in his tracks. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, I figured it out. My mother called him. She always liked the guy. Or, or maybe it was Kathy. Either way, I, I have to be honest, I was really glad to lay eyes on him. I'd been a fool. For a second, I thought about waiting to see if he'd be able to tell us apart, but uh, let's face it, the man had been through enough. So I said, Hernando, it's me. But what happened next caught me off guard. It was the other me that spoke up startled. You know Hernando, Renee said. Hernando went and stood beside her, protective and yet tenuous. How? One word question was all I could manage. Hernando's mother, Agata, was behind it. He had been inconsolable, suicidal. Agata told him that I was nothing, easily replaceable. 
She paid a facial recognition outfit to find another me. And they had. They'd found another me. Hernando came to Vancouver right after I left Bogota and sought out Renee because she was another me. And they hit it off. She taught him to rock climb. They went rock climbing together. <sighs> Somehow that's what finally sank me. Renee and I looked at each other like two spare tires in the trunk of a car going off a cliff. Hernando sat down. We ate cookies. There was nothing to say. It was like three ghosts having a tea party. <laughs> I live alone now. <laughs> I don't even trust the mirror. <laughs> Who the fuck is that in the mirror? I swear to God, sometimes she looks back at me with this evil smile. She talks too. You know what she says? Ditto. Ditto. I was bored. I have money. I decided to dress as a priest. I contacted my person at Burberry, a Nigerian tailor named Harry. I told him I wanted the clerical collar, the clergy shirt, a black rabat, suit, trench coat, cassock, and a cape, and a black fedora. Harry opined that, strictly speaking, Burberry didn't have a clerical line. But he would reach out to Ricardo Tishi, the, the head man in London. Harry felt Ricardo was searching for something new and might be excited by his idea. He was right. Ricardo Tishi flew to New York and met me in a private office in the flagship store on 57th Street. Harry served tea and took notes, and Mr. Tishi was, oh, was an elegant man. Beautifully turned out, of course. But as he spoke, other attributes came vividly to the fore. I, I could see how his resolve, I, his spirit of adventure, his quiet madness. Men like him only have one foot in the world. The other foot kicks over conventions in some enchanted inner boutique. <laughs> I knew this man, and I knew why he wanted to meet me. He was like a genie in need of a wish. But first he needed to assure himself that I had the necessary flair to own this idea personally. It's not enough to foresee a fashion. One must have courage. Ricardo essayed my level of panache, mentioned the chance I took wearing a fez. He went on to compliment my steel glasses and eelskin boots, then became serious. He asked why I'd become interested in this look and why, more importantly, I thought of Burberry. Well, I was candid. I told him I missed the idea of milkmen dressed in white, livery drivers, doormen in gold epaulets, pro proper train conductors, hunters in pith helmets and blouse trousers. My dissatisfaction was much more than just mere nostalgia. Uniforms clarify society and at the same time render it exotic. And yet in our age, uniforms are denied to the vast bulk of humanity. What uniform, for instance, would be appropriate for me to wear? I'm neither a tradesman nor a scholar. On the other end of the spectrum, since the end of aristocracy, simply being rich justifies no formal agreed-upon display. This is why I'd come to Burberry in the first place. In its infancy, the company had invented gabardine, made clothes for polar explorers, adventurers, then military aviators, officers. That history of adventure informs every trench coat and overcoat they design. I had heretofore enjoyed the courtesy of Burberry, the tang of militarism without the accompanying sting of battle. But 
Now, these boyish pleasures felt increasingly unearned. I needed a uniform that identified me more truthfully, less grandiosely, yet set me apart. If I dressed as a priest, I was declaring myself available for consultation, advice, even the sharing of doubt and despair. I was on a spiritual journey. Why not dress as a spiritual man? After all, I had a soul. Why not exploit it? Ricardo was sold. He flew home and disappeared into his Mayfair studio for a month. When he emerged, he had designed a clerical line of clothes for the man who was not ordained, but nevertheless struggled with God. A kind of existential soldier, touched with grace and a quiet prosperity. The buttons were slightly magnified, droll even. The whimsically small fedora fashioned of black felt seemed a gentle jest, which was quickly leavened by the clerical co collar's sudden note of sobriety. When I slid into the double vented coat, I was delighted to discover the pockets lined with green silk and fashioned with black elk bone. I felt not only well clothed, but understood. No, explained. When I first walked into the 21 Club, so attired, a reverential hush greeted me. The maitre d' solicitous beyond the ordinary showed me to a feature table. And he did so. I could hear the glittering clientele pause in their circular chatter. I had invoked a kind of pious pause. What more could I desire? Yes, the women love it. Where was the ring? I stared at the open box. I'd proposed, Alice turned me down. I got drunk. I remembered that much. Very drunk, unusually drunk. Did she take the ring? After checking all my pockets and everywhere else I could think of, I called her. No, she didn't have it. I could tell she thought I was using the missing ring as an excuse. My proposal had been a Hail Mary pass, and the call probably struck Alice as a pathetic ploy to keep the conversation going. I hung up. It was a $17,000 ring. I was doing okay, but seventeen grand was a third of my savings. I called the steakhouse where I popped the question. No, they hadn't found a ring. Had I taken a cab home? I had. I remembered saying goodnight to somebody in a cab, a woman, getting out, and then the cab takes off with the woman still inside. I couldn't remember what the woman looked like, just that she had... Hoop earrings. My phone lit up. Unknown caller. I answered it. It was her. The woman from the cab. She had my card. Her name was Angela. She asked how I was feeling. I was honest. She laughed. She had a good laugh. Big. Relaxed. <laughs> Do you remember everything, she asked. I told her I didn't remember anything. And that set her back, I could tell. Her voice dropped an octave. Are you serious? A big pause opened up. After a while, I managed to ask after the ring. Had she seen it? She didn't say anything. And finally, I blurted out, Look, all I remember is that you were wearing hoop earrings. That's it. A little quake had 
come into her voice, and my mind raced. I felt this huge wave of guilt. What had I done? Was she crying? Had I slept with her? And suddenly, I realized I was desperate to go to the bathroom. And I asked if I could call her back in ten minutes. She said sure, and hung up. I ran to the bathroom, did my business, and realized that I couldn't call her. I didn't have her number. Unknown caller. Ten minutes came and went. She didn't call back. It's beginning to look like she had my ring, and that was that. Had I slept with her? I couldn't imagine it. I started to vaguely remember a second place I had been, and Irish whiskeys. And a wake of nausea hit me, and then passed it. I needed to eat. I went out, holding my phone in my hand in case she called. In a deli, I got a, an egg sandwich and a coffee, and when I get back to my building, there's a woman waiting outside. It had to be her. She was beautiful. I mean, she took my breath away. How could I possibly have forgotten this woman? Her hair was thick and dark, a couple of locks askew. She looked at me like I was incomprehensible, a maniac, an impossibility. And I felt that way because, well, here was the woman of my dreams, beyond my dreams. But I didn't recognize her at all. And she had the ring. As soon as I was within reach, she handed it to me. I thanked her and took a bite of my sandwich to soothe my stomach. And maybe that seemed cold to her. It's hard to say. She... Something wasn't sitting well with her already, and me taking a bite of that sandwich really cinched the deal. She started to go. I caught her hand and said, Wait, why not come upstairs for a minute? But she just shook her head. She took her hand back and walked away fast. My mind wasn't working too well, and I didn't totally understand that she was disappearing until it was too late and she was gone. That night, the phone rang. Unknown caller. I was asleep. By the time I got to the phone and tore it from the charger, the ringing had stopped. There was no message. I never heard from her again. She was my other life. You have one of those? I sold the ring for half what I'd paid for it. I, I thought about keeping it against the day I found somebody else to marry, but it didn't seem right. It's been three years. I keep my phone by my bed now, but I know she'll never call. I had my chance. I just didn't know it. Loretta Vega, you walk by my house like a fancy dog and barely give me a look. I will make you pay for that. When I'm done with you, you'll be crying to your mother that I'm the best food car cowboy in the Bronx and you've got to have me. There's no hurry. This is the fun part. You said to me at the bus stop last Tuesday that you have no use for a man who tells tales and we both know that's me. But here's the thing. I don't have to tell you the truth. I don't even know myself that. When I lie, anything is possible. If I tell the truth, you win, and I'm an asshole. The difference between you and me is you know I'm a liar, and I work with it. You're too busy retouching your tiny story to make it interesting. I'm the fascinating one. <laughs> we both know that. I'm the one a movie star would want to play. I'm charming when I'm alone, staring out the window. I'm charming when I'm asleep. Haven't you noticed? How complicated my eyes are. I'm the cat and you're the mouse. You may get away a few times, but that's just the fun. 
The real problem is you. How are we going to make you a prize worthy of me? I've seen you dance. You could be a thousand other women. <laughs> I'm having a vision right now. Look at me. I see a thousand girls dancing in a line. I'm trying to pick you out and I can't because you dance like everybody else. Now look at how I dance. I know you know how I dance because you made fun of me last week at your sister's pizza party. You said I look like a broken toy. I'm not broken, Loretta. I'm me. Unlike you, I just am. Like a whirlwind over the ocean or a, a prehistoric monster. You're a victim of society. I'm the future. In the future, everybody will be dancing like me. Except me. By then I'll be dancing like God or something. For the moment, I can't help you. I see you running around with Raymond Velasquez <laughs> with his bow tie. What do you talk about? <laughs> he looks at you like you were religion, and I'm sure you like that now. But what about Infinity? Do you remember Infinity? Because Infinity will destroy Raymond Velasquez and anybody within 100 feet of him. Meanwhile, Infinity is my friend. We hang out together. In fact, as I think this through, I'm your only hope, Loretta. This entire era of history is not going to survive. Anybody who gets comfortable here will be swept away. I know because I'm not comfortable here. In fact, I hate it here. No, that's not true. I love every morsel in this world, every fishbone and gum wrapper that flies through my life, but I have no one to share it with. That's killing me. You know what? Stay away from me. Yes, I'm lonely. Yes, my heart is broken. But you didn't make me lonely. And you didn't break my heart. Time did. You wouldn't understand. You don't understand time. It just hit me. It's always going to be like this. I better learn to like it. I'm marooned on the most beautiful island surrounded by endless ocean. On a planet not of my choosing. Why wouldn't I lie? The truth is tough. Infinity is my only friend. Adios. We didn't like each other. And I saw him, the air got heavier. We never had a decent conversation. He looked at me like I was an unexpected problem, like the day had been going fine and I ruined it. I wanted to punch him in the face. He cleaned up at the club where I sang. I couldn't shake the feeling he was the reason I couldn't get a manager, even though that made no sense at all. <laughs> Once I asked him where he was from, Philippines. <laughs> he looked like that. A wide face, coffee color, not tall, with black eyes that told you nothing. He didn't bounce it back at me and ask where I was from. He wouldn't give me that. I did a set two nights of the week. The rest of the time I worked at a vintage clothing store. Management had me do two sets one time because of a no-show, and after that they asked this guy to drive me home. We didn't talk the whole way. I thought I was going to pop. Got so alert. I never looked over at him. <laughs> he didn't even seem to register I was even in the car. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. When is she going to fuck this guy? Well, I'll tell you what, I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> I was thinking murder. <laughs> the morning after the car ride, I got a tattoo on my foot. The guy who gave it to me looked like a monster. It hurt like fuck. I'll be honest. I, I like that it hurt. 
I'll be even more honest. I came. The tattoo was two words. Keep off. I've never had an orgasm with a man. I made the mistake of telling my boyfriend and he ditched me. Ego. Some douche screwed me when I was 13 and it was bad. And every time after that, no matter who the guy was, I just remembered the douchebag and shut down. I've had a few boyfriends, musicians mostly. I like musicians because they don't talk much. I like having that space. I need a lot of space. That's why I like being on stage. I can feel the space around me. I feel the protection. I feel separated from myself when I sing. Well, she sings and I feel. It's like a struggle. I sing because I feel so much, but there's no relief. The music is telling the truth. But every time on my side, I fail the music because I'm some sort of a liar. That's what keeps me coming back. I want to tell the truth like the music does. The guy died, the Philippine guy. Crashed his car, maybe he was drunk, I don't know. It was raining. Management told me like it was the weather report. I had no reaction. I did my set. And nothing was different till the last song. I noticed that my foot felt like fire, the tattooed foot. I stopped singing and talked to the band. Then I sang that old car song, Drive. You can't go on thinking nothing's wrong, oh no. Who's gonna drive you home tonight? I went into it like singers sometimes do, like it was an unknown country. They tell me I sang for 12 minutes. I don't remember. That's the night I got a manager. <laughs> I'll never be free of this guy's ghost. That's okay. Everybody's remembered by somebody for something, right? I wonder who will remember me. The best way to get away with murder is don't talk about it. And I never have. This is what makes murder so lonely, that and the guilt. My guilt is a room I visit rarely and when I do, I'm the only one there, or so it's been, until today. It's an occult experience, taking a life. It doesn't just spook you out. It also renders you spooky. So I'm spooky. My grandfather was a German immigrant. He passed away when I was 10. He was a preoccupied man, a musician who had experienced things of which he never spoke. But his play of Schubert in particular was colored by an understanding of something beyond speech, beyond perhaps what we understand to be human. He sang one song, the Doppelganger, and when he sang it, which he did but rarely, it left me mute, that such pain could exist. When he'd voiced the last note and would thereafter fall silent, the household fell silent with him. There were numbers on his arm after all. He was my teacher, and in the course of things, he accidentally revealed to me that music was my life. Perhaps it was the way he rested his hands 
on the keys before playing, regarding them as one would the hands of a stranger. I identified with this pause and this alienation. The length of his fingers would lie there lifeless. Then, suddenly, the skeleton inside his hands would arch awake and latch. In that moment, when the music used him, I found my use. Just shy of 40 years ago, I was not spooky. Or maybe I was. People don't change, right? I've always had visions, the kind of thing Dostoevsky talked about or poor Chopin fell victim to. Like Chopin, I have a touch of epilepsy. Focal seizures, they call them. I start staring and walking in circles and often for a minute, I can't hear anybody. My seizures start with a kind of circular buzzing in the head, following by what I call a flash. These flashes are pictures that move slightly, sometimes a lot of pictures, unrelated, sharing only a quality of intense foreboding. I linked illumination with unraveling and pain and I prefer to avoid mirrors and self-inspection. At certain moments, it's imperative not to be seen, I think. One can weather much if invisible and oblivious, and I had mastered both, having found it necessary to repurpose my life in a firmly unreflective way. Until the Dane, that is, whom I heard before I saw, like one hears the understated beginnings of an avalanche. He was counting off a Scarlatti sonata in that exacting, suffocating way that dance teachers and choreographers have. I walked in, my arrival interrupting his rehearsal. He looked at me bluntly, and suddenly I was dirty and he was clean, just like that. My reaction to him was almost molecular. I instantly and irreversibly absorbed the entire bright light of his being. And still to this day, when I think of him, I am the dirty party and he is spotless. The first thing he said when he took the door from me was inigkeit. I had no idea at the time what that word meant, but to avoid unnecessary suspense, it is a German word and it means depth. It's a term associated with musical appreciation, which makes sense as he was looking at the piano when the word fell from his lips, almost it seemed without his knowledge, which perhaps it did. The funny thing was when he called me Enigkeit, I knew instinctively that it was accurate and that was not a good thing. The piano was massive. It had a busy veneer of zebra wood, I think, and had been converted in some bygone time from player to manual. I tuned the piano and then, shocking myself, sat down and played a passage from the Scarlatti Sonata I'd overheard. I guess this was my way of showing him I was somebody. It didn't work. When I glanced up for his assessment, he offered his impassive verdict in a single word, bloodless. The conversation died there and then as if by rifle shot. Across from us, the wall was mirrored. There was a dance bar, a couple of kids in tights. I rose to leave and again, he held the door. I might have thanked him then, had he not also put his other hand on the small of my back, which enraged me. Why, you ask? If you've ever had a choreographer put a hand on you, you know it bypasses the mind and dictates its vision directly to the body. He had that touch. A circuit was completed. My flesh heard him loud and clear. He wanted me gone. 
My flesh heard him, but beyond him, it heard more. Another entity, the cloud of all languages and numbers in which we blunder. And it made me angry and sick too. A surfeit of knowledge is no gift to a woman who prefers the dark. I fell into a kind of knowing. And so it was that I practically fled, the steel door shutting behind me like a portcullis. But the image of him, of him somewhere behind me, rejecting me as I was, his icy eyes, his hand, where the hand took me, well, the whole thing lingered. I felt myself seized somehow, like my grandfather's resting hands were seized with a music both alien and too personal. Something shifted in my heart. A dull boom rocked me like the cannon fire that once upon a time dislodged sunken suicides from the river. I wandered the city and I drank a lot, bourbon and ginger ale. Much later that day, midnight, I found myself on a roof. I became aware of a sensation. I felt a hand. There was a hand pressing against the small of my back. I looked around. Then I saw him. A guy was sitting in a beach chair smoking a cigar. He looked like a businessman, cheap suit. I saw you, I said flatly. He sat up in the beach chair coughing and smoking and he smiled a little. There was malice in it. He had the eyes of a snake. Something in what I'd said had revived him. I didn't like him being affected by me, even momentarily saved by me, because maybe it isn't a good idea to save evil. Maybe you have to choose. I looked at his face. I knew what he was. There are people who fly away from the sun and towards the dark places like upside down geese who seek winter, maybe because the dark is almost everywhere and the warm sun is hard to find. He was one of those. For so long, I had avoided the light, not only because brightness hurt me, but because I was searching for something that can only be found in the dark. A faceless thing. The flare from his lighter found the lesion in my brain. I started walking in a circle. I had the flash. It was the same as it always was, but each time more occult like gilt-edged tarot cards falling in a flame. Like Scarlatti Sonata. Like Schubert, whom my grandfather sang with such inichkeit, such knowledge of the depths, but all the while clinging to beauty, which is perhaps buoyant and saves us from drowning. I saw this man, a young girl under him, her pink shoes scattered, and me at 17, frozen by the arrival of a temple. And then I pushed him off the roof because I'd seen that too. He never even screamed. I knew he wouldn't. What I didn't know was that he had a suicide note in his pocket. That's how I committed the perfect crime. He had been planning to kill himself. The next day, I walked into the Dane's rehearsal room and played for him the passage from Scarlatti. I didn't ask him afterwards what he thought because we both knew. 
The music wasn't technical anymore. It was covered with blood. That's how it started with him. What are you looking at? I told you I was spooky. We all are. That's what I think. We're like gloves God puts on when the work is unwholesome. I will now play Chopin's Nocturne in E minor, Opus 72. I'm going to dim the lights. We don't want an episode. 